Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Paul Adepoju and uh, I'm, I'm the Community Manager for the ICFJ Pamela Howard Global Crisis Reporting uh, Forum. And um, we are glad that you are able to join us today uh, for another uh, what promises to be interesting conversation. And um, since last year, uh, we've been having a lot of conversations around journalism and uh, we've looked at different aspects of how uh, crisis reporting, how journalists are affected by crisis reporting and how crisis reporting is reshaping um, journalism as a whole. Uh, initially, we started with the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, we've also engaged and expanded our coverage of training and sessions uh, to also include uh, other crises, including climate change and several others. But every now and then, uh, we see conflicts uh, emerging and uh, journalists are always at the forefront of this conflict reporting to provide accurate news reporting. But uh, while every aspect of journalism um, is really, really important, uh, we are today interested in uh, probably what uh, the, an aspect of journalism that, are transcend, that has transcended beyond uh, the issue of TV and the photograph. We are talking about radio journalism. And um, even though radio journalism has been uh, for long, sometimes in the journalism space, uh, the risk of not taking of not taking them of taking them for granted uh, can actually emerge because while we are looking at video clips, pictures, and other stuff, uh, we also know that there are journalists at the forefront of crisis reporting, and that that's something we are choosing to focus today. And uh, we are being joined by Asip, uh, who leads uh, the Voice of America's uh, Afghanistan radio service. Afghanistan is a critical country, considering the fact that uh, it's. Uh, once in a while finds itself on the global news coverage, actually in times of crisis. And the most recent was the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. And um, uh, as he led the team and continues to lead the team at the Afghanistan service. So I would like to welcome Asif. Asif, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Paul. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about uh, our, our organization and, and my team and what we're doing uh, to keep the Afghan audience uh, informed about uh, what's important to them uh, about Afghanistan, the region and beyond. Yes, um, for our audience uh, information, uh, can you tell them where you are joining us from today and uh, how the realities of what you have around you could be in sharp contrast to what journalists there so might be experiencing? Thank you, Paul. So we are based in Washington, D.C., uh, our headquarters there. We have bureaus all around the world. We uh, I'd like to, you know, brag about our numbers and I'd like to brag about the great work that hundreds and, and you know, thousands, uh, if we count all our stringers uh, all around the world uh, of great reporters uh, are, are, you know, contributing on a daily basis and are serving our mission. Uh, uh, in line with our charter, VOA charter, which requires us to be objective, comprehensive, and balanced. Uh, we continue to have prisons uh, in, in, in various continents around the world, in various countries around the world, and we continue to do uh, our, our job uh, in an ethical manner, and uh, we continue to serve millions, hundreds of millions of uh, audiences around the world to try and keep them informed about what's happening in their countries. Uh, in some countries, uh, you know, we in the US take it for granted the, the ability to have objective news, unfiltered news, uncensored news. But in a lot, a lot of these countries, uh, you know, people have, uh, are, are not able to uh, get objective news, unbiased news, comprehensive news. And, and they tune to us uh, as, as Voice of America to consume their daily news about what's happening in their countries and about what's happening beyond in the region and, and in the world. Yes, so um, I'll come back to you, Asif, uh, for a moment. And uh, to all our audience, uh, as usual, we're always interested in knowing where you're joining us from. And uh, this could help us in guiding our conversations today so that we can tailor made some aspects of our discussions to where you are joining us from. In addition to you telling us where you are joining us from, I would also like to know uh, journalists that are on this call uh, to indicate uh, which medium, which channel they write for. Are you a writer? Are you a radio journalist? Are you a TV journalist? Uh, what kind of journalism are you practicing? And um, I would like to 
uh, be part of also know what you are dealing with and um so i can't honestly say this was the first time i may i the first time i heard radio i heard i listened to radio because i think personally and for most of us uh, radio is actually part of uh, we grew up uh, with somebody playing uh, turning the radio somewhere uh, whether we like it or not but for you i see uh, how what attracted you to radio journalism how did that journey start for you and um how has it been uh, your practice how is it do you consider it different from other aspects of journalism thank you paul so uh without getting into too much history i was a listener of the voice of america i was born and, and raised in afghanistan i came to the us in 2008 for for college and, and joined voice of america in 2009 it's fascinating to be working with the same team that I grew up listening to them. My dad was uh, a religious listener to, to Voice of America, and he would tune into the radio early in the morning. Uh, and at times he would annoy everyone else because the programming would start at five in the morning. And uh, during winter time, that's too early uh, to, to be tuning in to, to, to radio. So I grew up with uh, listening to Voice of America. And then when I came to Washington, I joined it uh, as a reporter. Uh, I was a newscaster, I was a radio host, and I worked with the Afghan service uh, on multiple platforms, including radio, primarily radio, up until 2016. That's when I moved on uh, and uh, took over as the managing editor for the extremism watch desk, uh, which was tasked with covering news related to terrorism, extremism around the world, you know, national security and insurgencies. I was on that job up until 2021 in July. That's when the leadership asked me to, to come back to the Afghan service uh, to uh, lead the service. We have operations on digital side, 24 seven op operations between Dari and Pashto. We are uh, catering news and information to about 12 million Afghans uh, between Dari and Pashto, the two languages. On radio, we have uh, 12 hours of radio programming. And uh, recently, we launched our satellite channel. We have a 24-7 satellite channel. And we are uh, in the process of merging uh, radio with our satellite stream and with our digital operations. And what I mean by that is there is this, this understanding about radio that on other platforms as well that, you know, TV came and it replaced radio and then digital came and it replaced TV. I think uh, it's, it's not replacement. I think it's uh, more of an evolution. Uh, these platforms evolve. And I think uh, as media organizations, there is a need to adjust to that, to have the required agility for it. And uh, in, that, in that spirit, we are continuing to value our radio operations uh, and, and you know, grant them the, 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 the significance that, that it, uh, it deserves. You know, we, uh, in Afghanistan, if I give you Afghanistan as an example, we have we still have a pretty uh, big rural population in Afghanistan, and their medium for receiving information, their means for receiving information, is still radio. Radio is still relevant, but uh, it, it 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 cannot be stuck uh, in 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 time. What I mean by that is, if you know, radio is on an FM station or a medium wave or a short wave. You need to have the required agility to be able to reach your audience, wherever they may be. They might be the drivers that are commuting. They might be people on social media uh, that are there. Uh, Afghanistan has a, is a very young country in terms of its population. A lot of the Afghans are very active on Facebook, on Instagram. On, on Twitter and other social media platforms. Uh, they, they are also on, on, on TV. They're consuming their news through TV. So it's important. One of the examples I'll give you, for instance, we have 
launched three shows in the aftermath of what happened in Afghanistan that are very audience centric. Uh, they're called Afghan Narratives, uh, Today in Afghanistan and Hard Talk. All of these shows are also available on satellite, on our satellite channel. We call them radio and TV shows where people can connect with uh, the anchors, with the host, and they can, you know, and, and these shows are streamed live on our Facebook pages, uh, whether it's the Pashto Facebook page or whether it's the Dairy Facebook page, potentially available for millions of, of audience. And then another thing that's, that's important is cross-platform promotions. For instance, on the TV side of things, we will you know, tease whatever we have on the radio side of things. Uh, the anchor on the TV will say, we will have a discussion about this very important topic, whether it's press freedom in Afghanistan, girls' rights uh, to education, women rights, minority rights, inclusive government, Taliban accountability, and, and all of the above, we say we will have a detailed discussion with officials on this topic. Don't forget to tune in to our hard talk, which is starting in a few minutes. And then people, you can, by doing that, you can basically drive traffic from your satellite, from social media into radio and, and, and vice versa. So in, I am of the opinion that radio will always be relevant, no matter what, but it will evolve. It's not going to be uh, where it was in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. Uh, the, as news organizations and as news leaders, it's important for us to have the required agility to adjust to that evolution. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Asif. I, I mean, this, you are opening lots of conversations up, but I don't know whether I should interrupt or allow you to go smoothly. But I think uh, I would like to contribute to what you said, which is the fact that uh, radio would continue to evolve. Uh, about six years, probably it should be eight years now, I visited uh, Accra, uh, Ghana's capital city. And uh, very close to where I stayed, I was taking a stroll in the afternoon and um, I saw a small shop um, where they were selling stuff. And beside the shop that was selling petty things, uh, someone actually rented a shop, very small, uh, and uh, they, had, they were running a popular radio station from a very small shop. And it was in sharp contrast to what I had in mind about how how big radio stations ought to be. We are seeing further compartmentalization of broadcasting, of journalism, such that uh, that was even before the era of podcasting came in, that you can actually be starting a podcast show right from the corner of your room. I agree with you that journalism is going to evolve, but even as it is, uh, we are seeing a lot of media organizations uh, still aggressively rolling out um, radio stations uh hiv is one and um, in different languages uh, the bbc is also running a similar approach uh, to what uh, VOA is doing so for me uh for my question is this do you see the future of radio uh uh being solidified by its continual closeness to the to the audience or do you see the audience no matter how close uh, radio channels aim to get to them, still eventually losing interest in listening to radio? I, my, my response to that would be, if you continue to adjust to the technological developments, uh, you know, we have podcasts now, we, uh, you have audio on digital now, you know, if you continue to evolve with the technological developments. Uh, you know, there is an element of radio that no matter where we are, I think, and I'm of that, that belief uh, uh, that it will continue to be relevant. You know, I still listen to NPR. I consume my news, you know, in the morning uh, uh, from NPR. You know, I commute to work and on my way back, I love their shows. I love, uh, you know, their, their, their news. And I still listen to it. And I think there are millions of people in the US and around the world who are commuting to work and are going, you know, tuning into radio. So in that context, that you know, radio will always be there in that shape and, and form. 
But as far as you know, the the emergence of new technological platforms are concerned, new digital platforms are concerned. If news organizations have the agility, uh, the adjustability to uh, to adjust to new forms of you know platforms and and technology and bring radio up to speed with it. I give you an example of how we are merging digital with radio. Our radio live talk shows are streamed live on our Facebook pages, on Daddy and on Pashto pages, catering to a total of 12 million followers in Afghanistan. So if I don't bring radio into my digital platform, I will only be targeting the people who are commuting, the people who are in their uh, cars, and some rural uh, Afghans in Afghanistan. I will be basically ignoring big portions of the population, big portions of my audience. But the fact that I am you know, linking satellite with radio, linking radio with digital, I am diversifying our audience and I am meeting them where they are. You know, the, the, you know, the, the attention span is very important that we, we, we need to keep that in mind. It's, it's very important in terms of retention and in terms of keeping your audience involved. And, and the, the, you know, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, you, you need to be able to go where your audience is, that, that freedom of maneuver. That that you know you need to you need you you can't expect your audience anymore to tune in to your show, go into their living room and tune into radio at eight to nine p.m. For instance, is the time for our hard talk show. I do have audience who will go into their living rooms and tune into radio at eight o'clock, eight p.m. of Afghanistan time, and 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 listen to hard talk. But I also have audience who are on their phones. I have audience who are on their TVs. I need to be able to get to them as well. And, and I think if, if people who are in the business, if people who are working in the radio you know, business, if they continue to recognize that need to be able to diversify your audience, to be able to cater to that diversified audience, you know, radio will continue to remain relevant uh, means of information. And, and, and you know, I, I think for the foreseeable future, radio will be a very strong uh, means for uh, disseminating information to people. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll come back to you, Asif, for, for a moment. Uh, from our audience, we can see, I can see we have lots of um, participants that are actually having this uh, background uh, on radio, actually those that actually actively uh, involved in daily operations of uh, radio channels, including podcasts. So please and please, uh, I always like to have uh, audience participation. So you can, if you would like to share your personal experience in your current capacity, um, you can just raise your hand and I will invite you uh, to add uh, to the conversation. Uh, please just raise your hand and um, or I will come to you. Uh, I will prefer you raise your hand uh, so that I can also take your contribution. So I see one of the things that uh, we are hoping we can discuss today is to look at the peculiarities of radio journalism, especially when it has to do with crisis reporting. Uh, unlike I'm a writer and uh, what do you still have to do um, as a radio journalist? Uh, to be able to be effective in crisis reporting, that we don't see the tips flying around in tips, uh, in documents or in articles that are aimed at uh, improving crisis reporting skills of journalists in general. So what is peculiar to radio journalists? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll give you uh, what happened uh, last year in August in Afghanistan as an example. Uh, uh, to get into uh, your question. So uh, in, in July of last year, that's when I, I took over as the service chief for Afghanistan. At the time we had eight hours of radio programming and uh, we had an hour of TV programming and we had a shift from Kabul that was covering digital and then a shift from, from Washington. Uh, when the Republic uh, collapsed uh, in August, 
we we were lucky that we uh, uh, developed contingency plans in consultation with our leadership. Uh, they were futuristic about it and strategic about it uh, to, to make sure that we have alternatives. We overnight uh, decided to increase our programming to 12 hours uh, on 15 FM stations across the country in two medium waves. And we also parallel to that developed contingency plans for when we are not able to report from inside the country. Uh, we uh, you know, tapped into our uh, infrastructure in Central Asia and in, in, in parts of Europe to be able to have medium waves and short waves in case uh, the country faces a situation where there's media blackout. Now, you know, uh, parallel to that, we also develop contingency plans for digital uh, blackout. Uh, you know, we try to familiarize our audience with uh, circumvention uh, tools, Siphon, Inklink. Uh, we, we did a very aggressive uh, uh, promotions on our digital platforms to try and familiarize our audience with these technologies. And the same thing with, we were relying on two affiliates, two of the most popular TV channels in Afghanistan, Tolo TV and, and Shamshad TV. But we also parallel to that developed plans to have our own satellite stream to make sure that if the Taliban, which did eventually uh, uh, you know, uh, pushed us out of the country uh, from our affiliates. We had an hour programming on, on one of the affiliates seven days a week, and then we had another half an hour programming on the another uh, affiliate, uh, uh, you know, five days a week. We were uh, pushed out of the country, but we had an alternative. Now, to, to come back, th th this is just an overview of what we were dealing with in terms of the crisis that was, was developing at the time in the country. We had dozens of reporters across the country uh, that we, you know, we no longer were able to tap into for you know, obvious reasons. You know, there, it was risky and there were security concerns and all of that. All of that work shifted to, to Washington and we had to you know, quickly develop strategies to put people uh, in regional countries closer to Afghanistan, whether it's Central Asia, whether it's Pakistan, whether it's Turkey, whether it's India, to be able to report uh, uh, on, on the developments in the country. Uh, in, in terms of reporting, uh, you, know, it, it's imp the, you know, during crisis time, it's important to, to know the market. It's important to be strategic about your audience to know what the needs are. At the time, we were faced with a situation where we saw a shrinking free media landscape in Afghanistan. And there was a need for shows that were audience centric. What I mean by that is, you know, if you are a media organization in Afghanistan and you operate under the Taliban, uh, you know, the notion that you will criticize the Taliban as a reporter or as an analyst, you know, we are seeing examples of how Taliban are going after analysts or going after anchors. Uh, it, it becomes impossible. So we felt that need and re in response to that reality, we developed audience centric shows. We have thousands of people calling in uh, 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 to our radio uh, uh, station uh, uh, talking about their, their lives, their daily lives under the Taliban, whether it's violations of uh, the amnesty, the general amnesty that the Taliban announced, violation of women's rights, girls' ability to go back to school, women's ability to be in the workplace. So those three shows that we created in the aftermath of the fall of the Republic you know, I talked about them earlier, Afghan narratives today in Afghanistan and uh, a hard talk. The day, it was a Sunday, I, I, I remember August 15, the day that the Republic collapsed, we increased that same day our programming by four hours. We went from eight hours to 12 hours of live programming and we continued our live coverage on radio for three weeks, 12 hours nonstop. And in those 12 hours every day, we were getting 70 to 80 guests. We're talking about former police officers. We're talking about law enforcement officers, 
female judges, we're talking about ministers, cabinet level ministers, deputy ministers, members of parliament, generals, uh, some of the audios that uh, you know, I would have loved to, to share with the audience here, we had soldiers weeping on air uh, and, and, and talking about how they were betrayed. Uh, they wanted to put up a fight, for instance. We had female uh, judges that say that they were let down by the international community. We, we had uh, uh, soldiers that say they want to they wanna, uh, they want to put up a fight. They they were sold by the politicians. So uh, we quickly emerged as as uh, as a reliable source of information for people, and also as a platform for Afghans to be able to raise their voice. And and uh, you know this this uh, this trust that we have built over decades of work. You know this 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 is enshrined in our charter. This is enshrined in our best practices guide. We would like to be correct, not first. And we feel pride in that. We have built our brand on the basis of not rushing things, making sure that news is covered objectively, comprehensively at times. You know, one of the reasons we are credible among our audience around the world, not only Afghanistan, is we are not you know, there's that firewall. Um, I'm, you know, I, 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 every time I get an opportunity, I must talk about that. The firewall is basically people from the other, on the other side of the government, the US government cannot tell us what we can and cannot cover. And people on this side of the firewall who are reporters cannot get ideas from government officials. We are protected by law to represent the US as a society, not a, not a single segment of the society. And there were times when we broadcasted news that uh, was against, quote unquote, the US national interest. It was, but it was the truth. We, we, we one of our directors uh, always made this argument that Voice of America uh, is exporting First Amendment to the world. Uh, we are exporting, uh, you know, the. The, the, the ideals of freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and, uh, and, and, and we feel pride in that, uh, that, that ability to, to do that without you know, going too much into, into the details. So uh, our brand is decades of work of making sure that the news that we give to our audience is objective, is balanced, is comprehensive, we uh, we don't rush things, you know. Even right now in Afghanistan, there are so many deep fakes. There are so many fake videos. We put in place a UGC vetting team, uh, you know, user generated content uh, where people, you know, become ordinary people, become journalists. They shoot things and then they send it. We have a team in place. We get some of you know. We, 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 we take our time, we vet our videos, we look at the metadata, we, we make sure that those videos are correct before we report on them. So because of that, we were able to provide a platform for our audience in Afghanistan, and then they tuned into us and, and, and expressed uh, their feelings, you know, from all walks of life. And those shows uh, are household names right now. They were created last year. And uh, and I don't know. Can can you hear me? Oh yes, yes, I can hear you loud and clear. I don't know where where I left off uh, with with my thoughts, but uh, I'll just once again, uh, you know, reinforce the fact that uh, you know our brand is premised on on credibility, authenticity, uh, being fair, being objective, being comprehensive, and because of that. Uh, you know, shows that we have on radio, uh, not only in the Afghan service, but uh, across the organization have millions of followers. Uh, they tune into our shows because of that. Uh, we, we make sure that we get uh, everything right uh, before uh, we air them. Uh, we are not in the business of being first. We're in the business of being right. And that's very important for us. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that really uh, long thoughts. I'll come back to you uh, in a moment. Uh, when we talk about audio, uh, these uh, 
the new buzzword now i won't say it's buzzword but because it's been in existence uh, uh for so long and uh, it has already been at the forefront of many uh brilliant journalism works has been podcasting and uh, it also has to do with uh audio and um we are glad that uh padma uh, would like to uh from india from suno india would like to share insights uh so one of the questions i've always been curious to ask uh especially so in addition to your thoughts on these issues padma i also like you to share why uh with the advent of technology with her what uh as if i described about uh em expanding to multiple platforms that is now much easier to do uh, why is podcast very popular now and uh, what offerings do you think are currently available through the channel that could better advance the cost of journalism right thank you so much um for having me here i'm sorry i'm unable to turn on my camera at this point um so i mean i think like for why in pot i think uh, the podcast uh, sort of started picking up in india around 4 5 years ago um and right now what we are seeing here in india and i think also i would say from south asia is a pretty big uh, boom in um, you know in in podcasting uh, we started 4 years ago and uh, we uh, started with the intention of uh, you know doing uh, bringing the best of like audio journalism um, into into india because you know there is while there is a huge, very good history of radio community radio uh, there are some restrictions on the kind of um, things that you can speak on um, you know on 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 mainstream radio you know um, and it's uh, the only way you can cover news is on the all india radio which is government owned um so when we started podcasting i mean one the reason for for it was we wanted to look at some of the um underreported issues like you know covering tuberculosis covering um stories around adoption covering stories around lgbtqa and we felt that you know the medium in itself provided a certain amount of anonymity and also the entry cost of podcasting is you know much more cheaper than any other medium um and uh, we we also found that uh, you know when we spoke to a lot of people people said that they would be more comfortable if there was no camera you know talking about these subjects and so that sort of factored into why we got into um podcasting um and i think the reason why going up is i think it's such a democratic medium right like anybody can become a podcaster you um, you just need to have a passion towards a certain subject you know you need to have some thoughts around it um and the the scope of just the landscape of podcasting is so huge from from you know science to health to environment to um you know to to true crime i think like and pop culture i think the the scope of podcasting is so huge that it's only i think understandable that it is becoming such a popular medium but i think what i'm noticing from the global south and from india and other countries is that i think it's also becoming a medium because it remains one of those few mediums which is still not corporate owned in that sense um you know like i mean i'm suno india is still i mean we're not owned by you know it's we're an independent media platform we rely on grants we rely on listeners to support us to do our journalism work um and uh, i think that's i think one of the reasons why it's also picking up because you know it remains one of the more not so controlled sort of mediums as opposed to if you look at how television is in india television news or you know even print in india now it's more or less taken over um by corporates or you know every political party has their own news channel in, in every different language so um i think that's one of the reasons also why podcasting is picking up and uh, and i actually see a great scope in 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 crisis for audio and my the whole idea to start suno india actually came from our experience of my uh, you know making podcasts when i was with doctors without borders and uh, you know we would have uh, doctors and you know health workers on the field create these audio diaries you know as they were covering different crises whether it was the um, migrant crisis um, you know um, the refugee crisis i'm sorry you know the migrant crisis or the um, you know during ebola crisis so we would have to make audio diaries you know uh, because again camera wasn't easy to take there and, and have their thoughts and we would put them together as podcasts so um i think that's where the idea came from and i really think it's a it's a fantastic tool in crisis reporting so yeah I'll stop thank, there. thank you padma i think you have a question for asip can you ask asip a question 
yeah you know i mean i was very intrigued when he said about the user generated content like how difficult or how challenging is it to get it from uh, you know a crisis hit country like afghanistan you know um, and also what sort of um, what sort of fact checking measures do you have in place for this Yes, so uh, Asib will answer that question, then we'll be back to Kuba, who is also online to ask a question live. Asib, can you answer Padma's question? Asib, are you there? Oh. I think Asib is rejoining us. Let me get to you. Asib, are you there? No, this this is Kubaya. Kids are kids. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Can you? Okay, Kubai, Can you also make your contributions and uh, ask a question? Yeah, uh, I'm based here in Kenya. I'm a journalist, and uh, most of the time I report on I'm a criminal. Uh, I do uh, criminal stories. Eh? Uh, my question is uh, like most of. I do investigation stories, and uh, I find myself uh, most most of the time at the side of the law, whereby after you have done your story, you have aired, you find yourself being sued left, right, and center, uh, because someone, maybe the person you recorded, the body you used, the story, somebody has come to deny he's not the one. Now, so the pattern of the proof now remains to, to me to prove that it was this person and it's an audio. There's no picture to prove. So you find it's also a challenge. I don't know, you guys, how do you go about it at where you are or which method are you using to apply this? So maybe to avoid to be maybe part of the, you find yourself being the, the, the wrong side of the law. Okay, um, to, to provide a clearer perspective, uh, can you give us probably an instance uh, that this has really happened? Um, what, what available evidence did you have access to or the context did you have access to so that uh, ASIP can have a clearer uh, perspective and can be specific in his recommendations. Yeah, so we are having network issues um, probably with our guests and um, we are going to uh, see uh, Kubai, I'll keep you on the line and um, I'll come back to you uh, in a minute. So I've been, we've been able to uh, have a clear understanding of um, the impacts that uh, radio, the issues that radio journalists uh, are often having to deal with. And I think uh, something that uh, Kubai mentioned in his, uh, in his, in his uh, short question was uh, the peculiar, peculiar nature of uh, the burden uh, of proof. Uh, for organizations like uh, the VOA, uh, I think as he mentioned it, that they often have, um, they also, they, are, they often have a large team uh, to really help with fact checking and uh, other, uh, other, device, other uh, tasks. I think what is also important for us to note uh, is the fact that um, these resources on how to uh, validate is really, really important. Uh, for actually for journalists working um, in difficult settings and those that are also working um, uh, alone or very small team uh, should be able to have tools and access to uh, fact-checking uh, devices which is why I'm going to uh, greatly recommend uh, fact-checking tools uh, for journalists especially uh, radio uh, journalists uh, let me quickly bring uh, uh, these tools uh, up on your screen right now so that you can see um, what this is all about. And I think it's also something that we have in the works uh, to have a session on fact checking for uh, radio journalism. Is Asi back with us? I don't think we have Asi back yet. But one of the things that I think I would really, really um, I'm sorry, can you can you hear me? Uh, I can't, yes, I, I, yes, I keep yes. getting out. Yes, I think you're back now. Can you hear me, Asib? Yeah, I can hear you. I, you know, I, I tried it so many times and I I would get in and then I'll get kicked out. I don't know why. <laughs> it's okay. So we have some questions for you already. Uh, so let's start with uh, Padma. Padma, please, can you recast your question? So that, and we'll go back to uh, Kubai so that he can answer both questions. 
back to back sure. um no i mean i'm very curious to know more about the user generated content that you were talking about and also i mean how challenging is it one to get it from you know a you know a crisis hit place country like afghanistan and also how do you do the fact checking of these um, user generated content yeah so um we uh, in as much as we try uh, to keep the show running uh, we can't always plan for technical difficulties like this when they happen and um i know yes this is really quite frustrating uh so please uh if you are if you are in the audience and you also like to share your personal experience with us um please request the mic and uh, we can keep this conversation going until we have uh, a sub back to answer uh, these questions uh that uh burning uh that participants are asking around fact checking and uh, don't worry uh for those that are really are so worried and uh, concerned as we have uh, we can actually bring a sit back uh, to finish this conversation um that we are having so let's just see if we can get him back but while waiting for a sit um we I will always recommend um lots of resources that we have for you through the ICFJ and IGNet uh, network so we have a lot of resources for you as a journalist uh, that you as you can access through the international journalist uh, network uh, website so please and please uh, do not hesitate to visit www.ignet.org uh, um, for you to be able to access resources and that website is also a good tool for you to access uh, opportunities Gifty uh would like to make some contributions uh I think Gifty started in Ghana and is currently in the UK so Gifty you have the floor Hi Paul um hi, hi. everybody Yeah Asif must be really frustrated I can imagine myself in that situation and I will be so frustrated <laughs> So um yeah but but I think we've had um quite some information so far um and hopefully we'll be able to get the answers to some of the questions that have come i'm also hopeful that um even if we don't get asif back maybe he can send the answers um maybe later and then it can be shared via email um to the people who have asked because i think um the question um the question questions are quite um important to answer so i just wanted to share a bit of um <clears throat> how things work at join news so i worked at join news for um about 9 years i i just you know just left um, last year cuz I, I i thought that i needed i needed a break i was head of um security desk so basically i i report sometimes from, from conflict areas in ghana and but then i coordinate you know crime reporting any thing that has to do with relationships with the security agencies the police the ghana armed forces um the, the national security etc Hey, regarding um radio and having some of this um you know content on radio what we have or what we had at join news was that we had a, we run a tv we run radio and then we have an online platform so that was those were the like if you like for lack of a better expression the traditional platforms um through which we we did our broadcast but with digital media coming in we got presence on um twitter we got presence on facebook we got presence on instagram we got presence on tiktok <laughs> so everywhere that video is relevant and i think that goes back to what the the point that asif made about um user generated content which is the 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 presence of the organization on these platforms will help you to mine data so it will help you basically to identify what's going on where and it really depends because there are all kinds of algorithms and the way that the algorithms work is that if you show what your interest is you always get some of these um suggestions and you know things that point you in certain directions so there are all kinds of ways that you can mine data from social media as long as you are there what we also have is that we feed the tv so you got tv you got radio you got online so and the three are sort of connected um but the way that i believe it works is that there is a converged newsroom so the radio 
reporters and the TV reporters. When I started working there, we had a separate TV newsroom and then we had a separate new, a radio newsroom. But subsequently, the two newsrooms came together. With we tried to come together <laughs> with two different heads. You know, has some um, um, bumps here and there. But then <laughs> we merged. Am I taking too much time? No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. But then we merged. So what it means is that you've got radio and TV under one roof with one leader and it, 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 and it works perfectly. So what you're doing on TV is on radio, what you're doing on radio is on TV. And then subsequently on social media, you've got all these two and then you've got a social media team that makes sure that whatever. So, so at the end of the day, you realize that if there's say an investigative report uh, that's supposed to show on TV, there will be a time when it will show on radio there'll be a time when it is, it is online. There are times that they're showing, they're, we, we, we do simulcast. So you have everything going on at the same time on all the, 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 um, the platforms. What I would say from experience is that uh, the radio, when I started working there, the radio had very, um, like it was a huge platform when the TV was just starting. Basically the radio was what was used to market the TV and people got to know about the TV. So every time when they're talking radio, there's also this. So there's this synergy that will really work if you've got a leadership that um, is on the same page, basically, and you know the organizational goals and you use these platforms to, to, to get your organizational goals. So like as if was saying, you talk, when you're doing stuff on radio, you direct the traffic to TV if there's going, there's going to be on TV. If there's something happening on TV, and you expect people to go on radio to hear about it, you direct the traffic. So we sort of had this synergy that's working. And now we've added social media um, to it. And I think it's working, it's working perfectly. So yeah. yeah. So if I will call me now, I think I agree with you. I remember my last time on radio, at, uh, I went for a radio interview. And uh, while I was being interviewed, uh, I saw they had the camera. Yes. And, video, and that is live streaming on the internet. Mm -hmm. So you are having, I think it actually provides an, a more enriched uh, aspect uh, to the audience, being able to actually mm -hmm. see how things go on radio. But do you mm -hmm. think that doesn't have additional burden, additional task? On <laughs> I'll radio? tell you a funny thing. <laughs> the, the funniest part is that people forget that they are on TV sometimes when they are on radio. <laughs> of my colleagues and the danger in that is when you're interviewing politicians or when you're having conversations about very sensitive issues sometimes because for my colleagues who were very i am more i have more i was more of a tv person um until we we even before we converged but then i i i was employed as a tv person first the thing i found about my radio colleagues or people who were more radio you know like radio centric people was that they forget that they are on tv now they forget that they're on facebook they forget that they're streaming live and so they make faces sometimes and that can be very dangerous um sometimes they laugh um sometimes they're very disorganized in the news uh, in the in the in the studio it, it typically before we started live streaming and stuff, people won't see this, so they don't know what you what what you're doing. So it adds an extra burden in the sense that radio people, people who are used to being on radio alone, have to now readjust and be mindful that they're on TV as well. They have to make sure that they're not making faces. And when you are involved in um, um, so many things at the same time, because I know sometimes you are producing, you are doing this, you're doing this, maybe the line, you're making a phone call, like today we're having issues with Asif. <laughs> you're trying to put, put through a phone call, it's all going, maybe your producer, you know, you know, something messed up. And then you have to, it, it gets very frustrating. And if you're not careful, it will impact the quality of what you put on, on air. So that would say the extra burden. The extra burden again is that sometimes, you know, it's not everything that fits on TV that can fit on radio. And it's not everything that fits on radio that can fit on TV. So sometimes you have to make sure that you um you tailor the, the material. But when you're doing everything at the same time, you know, simultaneously, it can get a bit challenging. And so I think. Um, where we're going in journalism, it's about time that newsrooms put in place some of, uh, some training programs, you know, to get people to be aware of some of these extra um, inputs that you have to make if you are doing radio, which is now on TV, and if you are doing TV, which is now on radio. So, for example, when we were covering the election in 2020, um, it, was, it was a simulcast, so it was on TV, radio, and social media, it was on, on online. 
you have to be conscious to consistently announce. So this is on TV, is on radio, is online. Get your comments coming via social media, you know. And then when you are playing something on TV or showing something on TV, you have to remind or let your like sort of describe it to your um, your radio listeners. So right now we have this and so and so on TV, so and so is happening, is happening. Sometimes that might be also unnerving for those who are watching. It might be a bit annoying to those who are watching like, yeah, you, we can see it. So can you stop talking for us to see what's happening? <laughs> but, you, but you know, you have the burden of also letting your radio audience know what, what is happening. So these are some of the, you know, the tricky areas, but I yeah. think it's really, it's it's not, it's not such a big, if you, you were to, you, you were to weigh out the um, uh, way up the the differences, the pros and cons. You will say that there are more of the pros, you know. So mm -hmm. it's not so bad. People just have to journalists just have to be conscious uh, of the other times and and act accordingly. Yeah, thank you so much, Gifty. Uh, next time I'm in London, I remember to bring. Um... <laughs> <laughs> a nice LG branded item for you. <laughs> okay, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I think we have Asib back now. Asib, uh, are you back with us? I am. I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, oh yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. And uh, so, uh, Gifty has been giving a lot of insights, very highly interesting insights and highly relevant to what you've been saying. So we have to, we had two questions for you, and they all have to do with fact checking and uh, how do you ensure the burden of or uh, the burden of proof. So we can we can summarize it uh, uh, in this way that uh, how do you, how are you handling fact checking? Uh, how are you fact checking your radio shows, especially under the Taliban? So and what recommendations can you give to radio journalists uh, in going about uh, burden of proof? Uh, there, there is a lot of there, there, you know there is a lot of misinformation. There are a lot of fake audios, fake videos. Uh, that could really undermine our work as, as reporters. And Afghanistan is not an exception to that challenge that's before us as reporters and, and journalists on all platforms, not only audio. Uh, when something happens, whether it, you know, we're covering it on radio or TV or, or, uh, or, or in, you know, digitally, we have to make sure that we double source it. If someone says something, we, we don't go with one source. We go and check what EP is saying, what the wire services are saying, what Reuters is saying, what our sources on the ground are saying. We have people on the ground that, uh, you know, all our reporters uh, have developed thousands of contacts with, uh, with people. And uh, through those contacts on the ground, whether it, they're local reporters, whether they're local politicians, their local stakeholders, governors, deputy governors. We have people on the ground to make sure that we verify whatever is being reported. We have to make sure that, uh, you know, like I said early on, and I don't know how much of what I was saying was uh, able to get across to our audience here in this, in this meeting, but we, uh, we are okay with not being first. I think this rush uh, to getting things out is very risky. It's a very dangerous proposition. And uh, it's, it, you know, it, it, when you build your reputation, that's decades of work. One story can ruin that, can undermine that. And we are very cognizant of that. We are very prudent in that aspect. And we make sure that we, cross-check things, we dot all the I's and cross all the T's before we get something out. And even when it's out, our, our charter and our practices guide, uh, organizationally speaking, dictate that we reach out to the other side and give them a fair amount of time to respond. And if they refuse to respond, we will make sure that we add uh, the other side, that we put a, a request for comment from so-and-so or this organization or this country, and they refuse to, to, to comment on this topic. And if they do uh, show willingness to, to weigh in and, and say their territory, we then go back and develop our story with the, the new developments and new information that surface. But I think in, uh, in the age of information and technology and the age of 
uh, abundance of information uh, digitally, uh, uh, you know, on online. Uh, uh, the room to get things wrong is getting bigger and bigger. And I think as reporters, uh, it's it's very important that we get it right before we get it first. And a lot of the time, and, and it's also when it comes to the issue of ethics of journalism. There, you know, in, in some in some pockets uh, within our industry, there is this tendency to sensationalize things. You know, uh, we as an organization feel pride in making sure that we don't do that. Whatever is the news you'll get that news, whether it's in the teaser, whether it's in the headline, or whether it's in the body of the text. So, uh, you know, th this this idea of clickbait uh, journalism or making sure that you have numbers, it's, a, it's very risky. It comes at the expense of losing your reputation. And when you lose your reputation, building it back, when that narrative is built around your brown, a brand, it's it's very difficult to then get rid of it. So shortcuts, I, I would suggest against using shortcuts to get to people. Okay, and um, so let's talk about what you think the future of radio journalism would be, actually in crisis reporting. What do you think uh, would continue to be defining radio journalism and uh, what are the prospects and potential uh, bright size of uh, the practice of the journalism in general? I think radio will uh, continue to remain relevant uh, as a means of disseminating information to millions of people around the world, whether we're talking FM stations, whether we're talking medium waves, where we're talking short waves, we will continue to have radio playing a key role uh, in uh, keeping people informed, uh, you know, locally, regionally, and internationally. But uh, news leaders across the industry who are working uh, uh, with radio, uh, you know, have to be aware that, you know, radio cannot get stuck in time. Logical developments. Now, one of the participants brought up something very important, and I'm going through that uh, challenge right now. We have very, very credible voices that have uh, been with our organization for 20 merging radio with TV. Everybody is very excited to see them for the first time. Oh, this is so and so. I grew up listening to her voice, or I grew up listening to his voice. That that transition needs to be handled carefully. And also someone brought up the idea of, uh, you know, tailoring content to uh, platform. Entirely appropriate for radio audience and vice versa. So knowing your audience, knowing, you know, uh, the challenges, knowing, you know, what goes well with TV, what goes well with radio, and what should overlap. I think that's the key, but I will still bring this point home and insist that radio uh, will continue to be relevant in its most traditional sense, and radio will continue to evolve as it has been evolving, and radio uh, you know, uh, will need to be uh, incorporated uh, 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 you know, into this multimedia approach to news. Uh, the news is no longer only TV. The news is no longer only audio. The news is no longer only audio. It's a, it's a hybrid version of all of the above. It's a combination of all of the above, uh, you know, and, and we need to make sure that, uh, that you know, we adjust to that reality. Uh, and, and, and the sooner, the better, and, you know, uh, ruling out radio is, you know, I, I tend to, you know, even in the future, uh, God knows what will come in the next, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, you know, everybody, like I said in the very beginning, everybody was arguing that radio was replaced by TV and then TV was replaced by digital. We still see all three of them. And the smart organizations have adapted and they had the required agility for it to you know create a combination of all three mediums instead of ruling out one and i think 
for future, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it is important to recognize that. And it's important to, to uh, also training is very important. That's one of the things that I'm going through right now. People who are trained in radio, and all of a sudden you require them to become multimedia reporters and journalists, you need to have the patience. You need to train them. You need to prepare them mentally for it. And, and, and you know, it has to go hand in hand. It has to be gradual. It has to be smooth and step by step. Uh, and, and, and to, uh, you know, the earlier participants comment, you need to tailor content to a particular uh, uh, you know, a platform and a one size fits up all approach will not work. You'd have to uh, see what works and what doesn't and then adjust accordingly. Yes, I'm seeing a raised hand. Uh, Gifty, uh, do you have a, do you, do you have a comment or do you have a question? Oh, no, that's a thumbs up to, to oh. what you're saying. <laughs> that's like, I, yeah, that's right. I agree. Okay. Yes, thank you. And um, so, uh, I don't know whether you uh, saw the question uh, regarding uh, burden of proof. Uh, you mentioned the fact that um, many things that you do has to be, uh, you always ensure that they've been corroborated by one person, one or two or more uh, persons. So, but in the case where you got an exclusive tip that cannot, uh, you are not able to divulge the source, um, especially when it's radio, um, how do you do it uh, to convince the audience that, okay, this is true? And uh, how do you avoid litigations uh, from those that these stories are targeted that even though your sources uh, assure you that um, you have uh, confidence in your sources? And how do you do this without releasing their audio so that they can be easily identified and uh, you are still able to put that's your integrity as a journalist. It's it's a very key principle for us. We, I'll, 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 you know, I don't know if we have the luxury of time. I was, uh, I had a talk show one day. Uh, this was in 2013, I think. And uh, the, uh, the president of Afghanistan uh, now, uh, uh, you know, who's, who's in exile right now, uh, the former president of Afghanistan was, head of a commission that was tasked with transferring security responsibility from NATO to, to the Afghan security forces at the time during the Republic. And I wanted to invite him to our talk show. We had a talk show at the time and wanted to, you know, uh, ask him questions and have audience post questions to him. And I found his number through one of his confidants and one of his, uh, you know, people that were, were were in his inner circle, and I called him, and he said, uh, you should talk to my spokesperson. I said, I will, uh, but the spokesperson is not available. I found, and he's like, who gave you my number? And uh, he was uh, adamant uh, at me disclosing my source. He said, if you give me the person's name that gave you my number, because it's my personal number, I'm going to be with you for an hour. We will talk about everything that you want to talk, but I need to have that person's name. And I said, no, we, I'm not going to disclose my source who gave me your number. That's just an example. You know, when, 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 when someone, uh, you know, and, and that discussion never happened. Uh, the, the former president turned down the request to be in our show, uh, which is okay. It happens. Uh, uh, you know, we are in the news business and everybody is familiar with how uh, we at times are successful at getting people to respond to our audience and at times we're not. But going back to getting, let's say, an audio or a video or something that we know comes from a credible source, uh, it, you know, it, it boils down to our credibility, which to my earlier point, if you develop a brand where people look up to you, where people trust you, that if VOA is saying something, it is the truth because they have never had a precedent in which they rushed to judgment, in which they sensationalized a development and in which they get something wrong. That is decades of work. So if you get something from a source and you do not want to disclose the identity of that source, on the video side of things, you can blur their faces. And we have done that very recently. We have, you know, we have been blurring 
the faces of female students who give us interviews and express this, their, their disappointment in not being able to go to school. Female teachers in Afghanistan are giving us interviews and we blur their faces to not disclose their identity and their lo location uh, uh, so that there, there's no retaliation by any, uh, you know, anyone. And, and the same thing with audio. And if we feel like, you know, airing that audio will disclose the identity, the location of the person that provided us with that audio, we can say we have received an audio and we will give a disclaimer. Uh, if we can verify the authenticity of the radio, we'll say it's verified by our UGC teams. And if it's not, we always have this disclaimer that VOA could not independently verify the authenticity of the content that you are about to read or you're about to listen to or you're about to uh, uh, you're about to view, uh, and, and in some cases, if it's putting people's life in danger, we as a brand feel very comfortable about saying we're not going to disclose the audio, we're not going to air the audio, but VOA has received an audio in which, let's say, XYZ group is torturing people, and, uh, and uh, we have reached out to them for comment. Because we have built that reputation over uh, the years, people will believe that. People will, uh, uh, but, but it, 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 it's a very delicate situation. If, if we get it wrong, then, you know, our reputation goes out the window. But I think, you know, reputation goes a long way. Your brand goes a long way in terms of uh, projecting authenticity to your audience, in terms of making them believe uh, you when you tell them something uh, uh, and, and you know I'll, I'll just leave it at that yeah thank you very much so uh, one of the last questions I have for you is um, from your experience so far not just at VA but generally and what you know about the journalism landscape uh, what are your recommendations for journalists that are in this field and uh, for them to or to actually succeed as really journalists I know you've already mentioned some regarding uh, not rushing uh, to break the news. Uh, so what other sort of tips and suggestions can you provide? I, I think it's a, it's a noble duty. I think I uh, produced everybody who is in this field. Uh, it might not be the most lucrative business. It really isn't. It doesn't, you know, a lot of the time reporters are struggling with paying their, their bills. I, I, I get that and I respect that. I think there is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a non-monetary value to it. You know, you are providing uh, a voice to the voiceless. You are, uh, you are, uh, you know, you are, you are part of uh, providing justice. You are creating accountability. You are forcing people who are corrupt to not be corrupt. You are forcing people who are unjust to not be unjust. So if you look at, at, at the difference, the impact that reporters can have in their societies, in their communities, in their countries, I, I would like to think that uh, reporters are heroes, journalists are heroes, and, and we do, you know, even as an organization, we uh, unfortunately had incidents where we lost our great reporters, uh, uh, you know, while they were reporting. I think it's a sacred duty. I think uh, you know people who are in this business uh, are uh, serving millions of people. They are providing a platform for the voiceless. Uh, imagine a situation in which you know I'm, I'm going to give you the Afghan situation as an example. Uh, we have the show that that we put on air in the in the aftermath of the fall of the republic called Afghan Narratives. There we have thousands of people waiting in line to call us and to voice their concerns about how they're not able to put food on the table, how their girls are not able to go to school, how they are not able to pay the rent, how they are tortured by, uh, you know, uh, different groups, how they are intimidated. I imagine that platform not being at the disposal of our Afghan audience or our hard talk show where they face officials. We call in officials from the government. They directly challenge them. I'll give you a very 
a, a good example. There was a former military official who uh, erected a tent outside uh, a major province in eastern Afghanistan. And uh, he said that uh, he was, uh, his family was targeted because he was of his association with the previous republic and he lost everything that he had. And now he's living in a tent uh, uh, outside the police headquarter in Eastern Afghanistan. And we had a UNHCR official on the call with us, on the show with us, and they swapped numbers. And that person has been getting, I think $200 a month, if I'm not wrong with the, and $200 is a lot of money in Afghanistan on a monthly basis. And he's no longer in that tent uh, outside the police headquarter in Eastern Afghanistan, he moved to a house and UN intervened to help that person. That's just an example of, of how powerful our jobs could be uh, and, and how, uh, uh, how impactful our jobs could be and our missions could be. Uh, you know, words are powerful. Narratives are powerful. Keeping people accountable or, 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 or is a powerful thing. Perception about, you know, politicians, everybody, all the politicians, all, all the stakeholders, all powerful people would like to have, uh, you know, good image, clean image, and they work very hard to keep it that way. And if we are there to hold them accountable, we are there to hold them uh, responsive to their, you know, to, to people that they serve as public servants, then uh, we are we are doing a noble job. And, and I, whomever is working in this field, kudos to you, keep it up. You are bringing changes, uh, uh, positive changes in, into the world. You are making the world a better place, and uh, uh, and and you are uh, being voice for the voiceless. You are on the side of justice, and you will be on the side of justice in history. Yeah. So two last questions. One is from Kubai. Uh, the question reads: Does some journalists are working for free in some countries like Kenya? How can they access fact checking? unlike others who have funds for such work. Then, the, okay, the other question I want us to also take has to do with safety for radio journalists, especially that those that are reporting from the front line. So what tips do you think uh, uh, can this journalist should consider in order for them to be safe? It all boils down to how uh, sometimes we be tactful as reporters. You know, reporters are very important to have them at our disposal. As reporters, if you know association with a news organization, with a brand, is important and it goes a long way. Don't get me wrong; I recognize that. But if you are a local reporter uh, uh, in 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 you know in Africa or in Asia or or in the Middle East, uh, wherever you are, and you are a freelance reporter, you know, it boils down to uh, you know how you present yourself to your source. Let's say. And I'm a freelance reporter in Afghanistan, and there is a development in southern Afghanistan, and I need to talk to someone to verify something. You know, I'll just call the person and say, I'm a reporter, uh, and I am following up on uh, this development. You have been accused of corruption. You have been accused of, uh, uh, you know, torture. You have been accused of... Uh, you know, misusing your power or nepotism or whatever. What do you have to say to these accusations? Uh, before I get the story out, I would like to be fair. I'd like to be objective. I'd like to be balanced and uh, give you the opportunity to say your side of the story. And then that person, you know, put corner that person, but not in a, in a sneaky way. Corner him in, in an ethical way where he understands that you have uncovered something about him, whether it's true or false, it's upon him or her to respond to these accusations and, and pitch it in a way where you are objective, you are outside, you're not picking sides, you're just the third party who wants to seek the truth. And, and, and if you pitch that in a way where the person feels like if I don't provide my side of the story, this story is inevitable. This is gonna go out whether I like it or not. And why would I not provide my side of the story to make sure this guy made an effort. He's calling me, he's respectful, he's polite. Uh, in some cases, people might get mad at you. They might curse you. It's okay, you know, tell them, 
I am doing my job, sir. My job is to find the truth, to see what happens. I'm providing you with this opportunity. I'm going to share this news with uh, uh, the audience, whether it's on social media, whether it's you know me selling a story to a news organization. I don't want to be in a situation where in the future uh, uh, you will accuse me uh, that I did not provide you the opportunity with saying your side of the story. A lot of the time that works. So I first, my, my apologies. There's something wrong. I get you know, getting kicked out. But, uh, you know, in a nutshell, I, uh, I I recognize the challenges that you're going through. Anyone that who is, uh, anyone who's working without resources, it's not easy. It's a tough job, but, uh, you know, you're making a difference and, 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 and that's what matters. And, and, and that's what, uh, you know, is it, you know, th that's what is key at the end. Yes. Okay. Um, with all said and done, now, so uh, in a nutshell, what do you think uh, the take-home message uh, should be? And um, also, if you can give uh, recommendations to freelance journalists that are also working on radio. So what are your take-home messages and uh, what are your recommendations for freelance journalists? I think they, they should, you know, doing the great job they're doing. I, I think don't, they shouldn't be disappointed in this, uh, in this notion, you know, it's, it's pretty, in, in some cases, it's pretty vocal that radio is, you know, it's, it's irrelevant, you know, people are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you know, Clubhouse, Twitter space, and you're still stuck in radio, don't let that disappoint you. Radio will continue to be relevant in our lives. Radio is relevant, and radio would uh, inevitably uh, evolve. Uh, and it's a very natural process, but do not let uh, that talk disappoint you. Do not let, let uh, those, those uh, thoughts disappoint you. Uh, you will continue to... You know, audio is very powerful. If we manage it the right way, you know, having you know the, the right sound bites or the right audio sounds, uh, you know, it, it, it radio could be extremely powerful. And and my my final thoughts are, it's not going to go away. It will continue to be relevant. It will it certainly evolve, but it's not going to go away. Okay, um, thank you, Asiva, uh, and um, for everybody that has also taken time uh, to be with us on this call. Uh, it has been an interesting uh, conversation, and like he said, the uh, radio will continue to be relevant. Uh, radio has always been with us all our lives, and uh, like Asiva insinuated, it will continue to be here, even though it's going to be. It also uh, is also prone to evolvement, and uh, so let uh, you as a journalist uh, let all continue to practice uh, the rules of journalism, which is uh, always ensuring that you are reporting the truth, uh, not just prioritizing being the first, but ensuring that you are reporting the truth and um, so that you, the reputation of the profession uh, will continue to be intact. I want to say a big thank you uh, that despite um, the network issues that we had, uh, which we apologize for uh, already that we were able to gain insights from Masip and um, it's really really amazing uh, to see and uh, to hear from you your personal experience at the VOA's uh, Afghan service and uh, we wish uh, everybody actually at the team uh, that are on the front line the very best that they continue to keep safe and in their endeavors and their strive to bring us the news uh, across the world and uh, that's something we are happy that we've been able to do today to bring attention to what is happening uh, from their personal perspective allowing Asif to tell their stories uh, which he has really done uh, diligently and um, by sharing this experience we hope we've been able to inspire journalists in different parts of the world especially those that are working on radio and those that are also working on uh, virtual platforms like podcasts as we've heard uh, from the incredible uh, resource uh, persons uh, that shared their personal insights on what they need to do, how you need to structure your planning. And the take home for me is just the fact that whether you're on radio or you're on TV, the rules of journalism remain the same. 
and um, what we are doing will continue to complement uh, one another. I hope you've also taken notes of the tip that he gave on how to succeed at uh, radio journalism, how to be ethical, to be an ethical journalist, and also how to keep yourself safe. So I want to thank Asip for these and several others today. Um, we appreciate you. And for all of our audience maybe that would have liked to access more information regarding this initiative, Please check out www.icfj uh, for information and we also would recommend you getting access to resources via the IGNet platform. You can check the link that has been posted in the chat box www.ignet.org and we also invite you to be part of our forum where we can also take this conversation further and uh, at this forum we also share links to resources, to tools, to pieces, to tips and uh, story ideas that you can work on and um, we'll also be having a lot more to offer you our forum members uh, in the coming weeks i'm really i'm really excited to give you some news that i'll share with you in the in due course and uh, the only place that you can get this uh, any time of the day is uh, if you are part of our facebook forum which the link is already in just click the link request to join and i'm going to add you so until next week uh, when we are back with another interesting exciting and eye-opening uh, conversation i remain paul adipoju i really really have to thank stella uh, at the back end for technical support today uh, and um the entire team too i appreciate for putting this together so i'll see you next week and i say uh, thank you to everyone that stayed with us uh, throughout the technical difficulties from the beginning to the end. You are really, really special and uh, we appreciate to enjoy the rest of your day and have a great day. Bye, Hasib, and uh, we'll see you some other time.